Welcome. Today we are going to talk about how to fill in your automation gaps with function as a service or container as a service. My name is Brandon Beck. I'm a technical solution architect for Cisco. I've been with Cisco for roughly 17 years and a lot of that time I've been very passionate about all things programmability. A lot of what motivates me, what drives me around automation projects is my own laziness. I don't like doing the same thing over and over and over. So that's where automation becomes really a beautiful thing. And where we see really most folks striving to get to when it comes to automation as a general practice is what we see depicted here. So we wanna have some type of user portal, maybe it's your ticketing system, but some way where somebody can go in and request a resource or a service through an easy to fill out, fill out form and then from that, we have a whole pipeline of tools that go in and automate that work for us very quickly, very consistently. Maybe Terraform is a part of that tool chain to provision infrastructure, and maybe Ansible is in there to do things like configuration tasks. So this is a, a good overall objective for automation as a general practice, and that's no different for a lab that I manage within my role at Cisco in Austin, Texas. And this is all leading into what we're gonna talk about with uh, serverless as part of an automation use case. So some quick background, uh, myself and team members that I work with maintain a lab in Austin, Texas. And getting back to that automation objective, our user portal is a custom website that we wrote called the Austin Lab Toolbox. Within that, users can go in and select from a list of different lab environments that they can schedule time on. So we, we use this uh, lab as a way to do experiments with maybe newer products that Cisco is bringing to market or newer solutions to enable our field, to enable our partners. And if the training takes off, we might hand that off to DevNet or dCloud for wider adoption. So a user comes in, they select a lab environment, they schedule time, and when that lab is scheduled to kick off, we hand a description of that lab over to our lab orchestrator. And today our primary orchestration tool is AWX. In the future, that'll probably move to Intersight Cloud Orchestrator. But at the time this lab was created, that product didn't exist. So if you're unfamiliar with AWX, it's the upstream open source version of Ansible Tower, provides a really nice way of managing Ansible in your environment. So you can centrally uh, define your inventories, your group and host VARs that go along with that, your credentials. It also has a really nice RBAC structure to it. But most importantly for us, it has an API that front ends the whole thing, which is really, really nice. So when we kick off work to be done in AWX, what are some of the things we're doing? Well, we're doing basic Ansible stuff. We use the built-in modules that Ansible provides, community supplied modules, you know, modules that Cisco has developed for various Cisco products. We also have the need to provision infrastructure very often. And we have found that Terraform is, is a better tool for us, a lot of those use cases where we need to de deploy and destroy infrastructure as part of a lab environment. We used Ansible for that in the beginning, but we had to be very specific about the order of steps that we took. And we also had to write an additional playbook to go and destroy things in the right order. And Terraform just figures that out for us. So we use both of these tools in combination a lot um, what's kind of unique in how we use Terraform is we, we call Terraform from Ansible. So we're consuming Terraform from Terraform Cloud. So we can easily just make Terraform Cloud API calls through Ansible and say, go do this work in Terraform. There are though often times where we need to automate something as part of setting up a lab environment where the task doesn't quite fit the mold of Ansible or Terraform. And this is where we have to debate, like what's the best way to get this work done? And sometimes we do some fairly unnatural things to do that task and say Ansible when it just doesn't really make that much sense. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So to give more kind of clarity around where we would use or have a need like this, let's look at a, a, a very recent automation need that we had in our lab. So Cisco launched a new product called UCS X series, biggest compute product launch we've had since 2009. Um, 
and it was in very high demand and very low supply before we launched the product. So we were lucky enough to get an X-Series unit in our lab, and we wanted to set up a training environment for users and partners to get enabled on. So as part of this lab, we have a user. Here's our user on the left. And they need access to a few different things. They need access to the fabric devices that make up the X-Series solution. So you have, as part of X-Series, a compute chassis, and then you have these two external elements called fabric interconnects, and there's a console or serial port on those fabric interconnects that you initially have to plug into and set up. So they needed access to those serial ports via a console server. Once you give it a, a, a unique personality through that CLI setup, then you access it through a website or a web page that's hosted within the Fabric device, and you have to be on the same network in order to reach that. So we needed a remote desktop instance, just regular old Windows 10 RDP box. And to make it easier for external folks to use those connections, we wrapped all that in Apache Guacamole. So if you're not familiar with Apache Guacamole, it's a super handy tool that allows you to uh, define multiple backend connection types, such as RDP and SSH that we're using here, but it does it all through a web browser. So users can just log into this one web browser portal and they can then jump into their Windows 10 desktop or they can jump into their SSH console. And then lastly, we had a need to talk to the Intersight web UI, but users could just use their own workstation browser for that. So that wasn't a big deal. And this is the cast of characters of the lab environment that we created. But let's get into the more interesting part, which is how do we automate setting up this lab from one user to the next? It all starts with our upper level orchestrator, which right now is AWX. And we have to do a few basic things. One, we need to delete everything the user did inside of Intersight. So in order to manage this X-Series platform, you do all of that configuration inside of Intersight. And so whatever the user did in the lab, we need to go and undo. The next thing we needed to do was reapply a default configuration. There's some baseline stuff that we like to, to pre-provision for the users that make it a little bit easier to get through the lab. So we need to do that. Number three, we need to erase the, the, the fabric device configuration. So those are called fabric interconnects, and we need a, a consistent way to reset those to a, a good baseline. For the way users are interacting with the lab, they have a user account that's uh, backended by an Active Directory user in our lab, and so we need to generate a random password every time they go through the lab so that the previous person can't log in and hijack their session. Then we email the user all the lab information when their lab is kicked off. So here's your password. Here's some lab specific details for you. And we also have a WebEx room that we send to the administrators to say the lab set up correctly, all is good, or maybe it failed and we need to spring into action and, and figure out what happened. So most of these steps were pretty straightforward. A lot of it was done via Ansible. Uh, the reapply of the default configuration made more sense for Terraform. But there was one here that really caused us a lot of problems, and that was erasing the fabric device configuration. We spent days trying to figure this out and, and trying to get it with, done with Ansible because it made the most sense out of the two tools. And we just could not get it to work. And I, I know there's somebody watching this that could probably think of a way to do it in 30 seconds, but we, we could not get this to work until, this was a total roadblock for us, until we talked to one of the developers for the product who had this in their lab, and they were frequently resetting the device configuration through a script that they wrote. So we came across Gary. Gary has a script that can reset the fabric interconnects exactly the way we want. So Gary says, hey, use our script or use my script, which is, is, is sounds good in theory, but the problem is, Gary, we need to include this into our automation chain, our automation pipeline. So we looked at Gary's script, and we thought, you know, is there a way we can refactor this and, and make it Ansibleized? It just wasn't working out the way we would like. Now, I'll pause here and say, kind of in parallel to this, in the Austin lab, we had several Kubernetes clusters that we had stood up just for experimentation. Cisco has a, a site or a service within Intersight called Intersight Kubernetes Services, makes it super easy to deploy Kubernetes clusters. So we were like, why not? We set up a couple of Kubernetes clusters and we were just playing around. And we, we realized, hey, there, what if we could take Gary's script 
and containerize it. Like let's take all the all the dependencies of Gary's script and let's package that into a container. And what if we could execute it kind of like you do in AWS with Lambda? What if we could just take his function and make that a function, a service that we can include in our automation? And so K Kubernetes has a framework for that called Knative, which I'll explain in more detail, but it allows us to take, take Gary's script and wrap a runtime around it. And by runtime, that could be written in different languages. It could be Python, it could be Node, it could be Go, but that's making a, uh, it's taking Gary's script and wrapping it in something that, that allows uh, or provides more of a web service feel. So I can make HTTP calls to this script. I can do different methods like a put, a delete, a post, a get, and Gary's script could react differently based on those methods and the data that was provided. Now, are we refactoring at this point? Absolutely. There was a little bit of refactoring we had to do to Gary's script, but the core of Gary's script was pretty much preserved. So we're not doing a complete rework or rewrite. We're just changing the way variables get defined and passed in, and we're wrapping it with this runtime environment. If you're curious, how do I, you know, where did this runtime magically come from? In Lambda, it's just created for me. I can pick my language and, and AWS behind the scenes wraps that function in a runtime. Well, there are distributions out there you can look at from Kubeless, OpenFAS, Trigger Master, a few that come to mind where you can pull that runtime in and wrap it around your function. You could also, you know, the way Knative works, you could also write your own. Um, so the, the beauty of this though, is we're taking Gary's script that we know works, we're slightly modifying it so that we can run it as a container service. And now it's wrapped in an, a, a web service API where we can make HTTP method calls against it and we could pass data in and retrieve, retrieve data from Gary's script. So the big enabler behind this in our Kubernetes cluster was Knative. So Knative is a serverless framework that rides on top of Kubernetes. Think of it as an extension. And it's maintained by Google, who are the same folks who right, created Kubernetes. Uh, so they know a little bit about Kubernetes. And it's made up of two primary components. There's a serving component and an eventing component. We primarily were focused on the serving component. That's going to uh, do things like manage your ingress into your Kubernetes cluster. Anytime you need external things to talk to a resource inside of Kubernetes, you need an ingress. And by default, they use Istio, but you can use different options there. So it'll configure and manage the, the, the load balancer that's associated with that ingress. And it'll also auto-generate the URLs for the functions or the serverless deployments that you uh, use within Knative. It also manages the pods that get spun up as part of your serverless deployment. And it has some really cool things you can do around auto scaling, which we'll talk more about. Now, eventing is a really, it's a really interesting part of Knative. We didn't do a lot with it because it just wasn't a part of our needs, but it follows the CNCF cloud event spec. So you have, um, publishers who publish an event and in a specific format and it gets sent to your um, intermediary which would be the Knative broker which can then trigger uh, different types of consumer events and you could have uh, producers like github or kafka so there's there's a lot of really cool things you can do with eventing we just didn't need it for our use case but i bring it up because one it's a part of Knative and two, there are plans to talk about this topic in more detail in the upcoming Cisco Live circuit. So look for more details around that there. Back to Gary's script. We need Gary's script to automate cleaning up our fabric interconnects. There's also some confidential data that we need. We need a username and password to talk to the devices that we want to reset. So I could you know, hard code that into the container, which is a super bad practice. I could pass it in through the JSON payload. It's HTTPS, so that's not a bad idea. We chose to take that confidential information and put it in a secrets engine, such as HashiCorp Vault. Could also use Knative, or I'm sorry, Kubernetes native secret engine. Uh, but we use Vault. So through a little shim we put in Gary's script, we can go and retrieve the credentials through Vault. When I take what we've done with Gary's script and I combine it with what Knative provides, I now have a URL. So I can interact with this URL like any old regular REST 
API endpoint. Let's see that in action. So if I go into Postman and I put in the URL that Knative supplied to me, uh, there's some work you had to do on the DNS side with a wildcard entry to say anything that is prefixed by you know this address, point it to the ingress of my Kubernetes cluster. That's all well documented in the Knative documentation. But anyway, I put in the URL that it created and I just need to post in the data that's needed inside of Gary's script. So I need to know the target IPs, which would be the, the management IPs of the Fabric Interconnects, and then the name of the credential in Vault so that I can go and retrieve the username and password. When I take this in Postman, works great. How do I put that into my native tools? In Ansible, there is a built-in module called URI. Looks very much like what I did in Postman. I can put the URL. I can say it's a post method. I can say the body format is JSON. And then I can lay out the body. Really, the only difference here is Ansible typically is written in YAML versus the Postman body is in JSON. But the data structure is pretty much identical. Now, when I execute this in AWX as part of an orchestrated task, What's super cool about Knative serving component is we can do something called scale to zero. Scale to zero means there is no pod running in my Kubernetes environment that's running Gary's function, Gary's script, until traffic hits the assigned URL. So now when I make a request to that URL, Knative springs into action and it deploys a pod in my Kubernetes cluster to go execute Gary's script and reset my fabric devices. Now, if no more traffic hits that URL for 60 seconds, which is the default inactivity timeout, then it's going to dispose of that pod. So this is really nice and efficient in my Kubernetes cluster. I don't have all these pods that are running and doing nothing. It's, it's just in time provisioning. As soon as I need a pod, a pod gets provisioned. When it's no longer needed, it immediately gets disposed. Tying it back to the, the problem that we initially had, now in our in our list of tasks that we need to automate, number three is no longer a problem. We can use that Ansible built-in just like we talked through, and it, it works beautifully into that overall set of orchestrated tasks that we need done. So wrapping up, I want to challenge you with the fact or the thought that function as a service is not something, or even serverless, is not something that's unique to microservices that you're creating as part of an application architecture. Think about how you could use that practice to support your more basic automation needs. If you're not familiar with Knative, there's a ton of information out on the web. Knative documentation is very well written. There's a lot of, of, of labs that you can go through that are free to use. Uh, I would also say look at uh, a more packaged offering around Knative like Trigger Mesh. So do maybe uh, explore, look into what Trigger Mesh has to offer around that. And then lastly, watch out for more from Cisco around FAS as uh, a native part of product solutions and a part of our product portfolio that we have coming out. I hope you found this session helpful and enjoy the rest of Dev DevNet Create. Thank you very much.